Merci, Madame la Présidente. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it's an honour to take the floor before you at the end of this morning on behalf of Armenia. My colleagues have put to you the facts and the law to justify you exercising your power under Article 41 of the statute. And I will now move on to the concrete measures that Armenia is requesting from the court, and I will underline why these are necessary as they've been set out. Now, the facts before you are of the utmost seriousness. It's neither more nor less than the taking of hostage of 120,000 people, rendering their life impossible, unbearable, and then bring them to their knees, depriving them in midwinter of all essentials, solely because, solely because, they are members of the Armenian national and ethnic group. The obvious aim of this operation, orchestrated and supported by the Azerbaijani regime, is to give notice to the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh that they are at their mercy, to discourage them, to make them fed up with living where they were born, where their ancestors lived for centuries to cause the massive exodus of those who haven't already left subsequent to the war of 2020. That's the perspective that President Aliyev openly espouses. Now, you would have heard him, you would have read him, he declared uh, 20 days ago. If those besieged and surrounded Armenians want to leave, let them do it. The road will be open to them. Now, Madam President, distinguished members of the court, as you've been able to note since the filing of the initial Armenian application, the usual reaction of Azerbaijan to any accusation against it is to be offended, to issue wholesale denials and then start accusing in return. Distinguished members of the court, Azerbaijan can vituperate as much as they want. Nobody believes in their environmental fairy tale. Nobody believes in the so-called activist initiative of civil society in a country which is notoriously autocratic. Nobody believes that this has been the fault of the Russian Federation. Nobody believes that the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh would be free to come and go and that foodstuffs would arrive in sufficient quality like before, that families will be able to meet freely and that ill people will be transported without restriction. Free press doesn't believe it. Foreign governments don't believe it. The European Court of Human Rights didn't believe it. The committee, subsequently, of uh, ministers of the Council of Europe didn't believe it either, nor did the Parliamentary Assembly of the same organisation or the European Parliament. These important documents are all in your judges' folder under tabs 3 through 7. The UN Com High Commissioner for Human Rights has called the full re-establishment of freedom of movement in the Lachin Corridor the only way to ensure that the elementary rights of the population affected will be respected. Of course, this means the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. Finally, the major NGOs equally decried the humanitarian urgency. The corridor is allegedly open in both directions, but do you realise distinguished members of the court. What you have to do right now is to organise a convoy of the ICRC, of the Russian Federation Peacekeeping Forces, and solicit their agreement to transport towards Sarevan uh, sick people, the most seriously sick people, whose uh, care cannot be ensured by the hospital in Stepanakerk. And the same applies for the trickle-through transport of foodstuffs or any sort of essential daily goods. All the while hoping, of course, that the so-called protesters see fit to move off the road when the convoy approaches. Depends on their mood, doesn't it? It depends, of course, on instructions they're receiving from Baku. Distinguished members of the court, Azerbaijan is besieging Nagorno-Karabakh, quite simply, because the Armenians want to continue to live there and that the 
and that Azerbaijan cannot bear this. Nagorno-Karabakh has to change its name, has to change its culture, and all trace of secular Armenian present must be denied. In a word, Nagorno-Karabakh has to change its people. Karabakh is Azerbaijan, as the so-called eco-activists chant in chorus. This, the very official slogan directed by a fur-clad dignitary shaking a white dove in his hands until it falls dead on the ground. Karabakh is Azerbaijan. That's the slogan, a territorial slogan. It's a territorial and ethnic slogan. It means that the Armenians have no place in Nagorno-Karabakh. The facts speak for themselves, and the efforts of Azerbaijan to deny them or to denature them are as unworthy as they are in vain. Your court is the final guardian of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Azerbaijan signed up to it, but acts to the contrary, even if the environmental pretext were true, but we know it's baseless. Even if it was true, it must still bow to the imperatives of the Convention. Indeed, you don't save nature or natural resources by preventing 120,000 people from eating or being given urgent care. And this all the more so when this violation of elementary human rights, by its purpose and effects, targets individuals on grounds prohibited by the Convention. The road blocked since 12 December, you know, only serves the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. It was given protective status by the agreement of November 2020 precisely for this reason. But Azerbaijan seeks to have you believe that its blockade is in no way discriminatory. But distinguished members of the court, to see through Azerbaijan's plan, you really have to ask yourself two simple questions. Why staged a so-called demonstration precisely here? Why do it in midwinter? And why for 50 days already with no end in sight? Distinguished members of the court, Azerbaijan, you know, has remained deaf to the numerous appeals of the international community to end its blockade so that the highway be open for use once again as it was before 12 December. Azerbaijan dismissed the provisional measures ordered by the ECHR, nor did it comply when the Committee of Ministers quite exceptionally enjoined it to do so. Your court has to act. And you must act swiftly. If you do not indicate the provisional measures, quite soon there will be no uh, more Armenian men and women in Nagorno-Karabakh. They will have fled their mountains to save their life, as President Aliyev invites them to do. If you don't indicate measures that are perfectly clear and bare of ambiguity, Azerbaijan will exploit the least loophole to achieve its sinister ends using some other subterfuge. Finally, if you don't indicate measures, not only for now but the future, everything shows that Armenia one day or another will be obliged to call on you with urgency once again. Madam President, the, the first provisional measure which Armenia requests is... Azerbaijan shall cease its orchestration and support of the alleged protests blocking interrupted free movement along the Lachin corridor in both directions. Armenia is not asking you to order to Azerbaijan to disper disperse by force those so-called demonstrators, because given the trilateral agreement, it's not for Azerbaijan to deploy security forces on the road along the corridor. However, it is vital that Azerbaijan immediately ceases the orchestration and support, financial, logistical or otherwise, of any protest blocking or hampering free movement in either direction along the corridor. 
Armenia also requests you to order that Azerbaijan, I quote, shall ensure uninterrupted free movement of all persons, vehicles and cargo along the Lachin Corridor in both directions. End of quotation. This second measure is complementary to the first and equally necessary. It is important that Azerbaijan be given a positive obligation giving effect to the undertaking it accepted by the November 20 trilateral agreement, whose exact terms my colleague Mr Martin recalled to you, and which Azerbaijan has breached in a manner perforce discriminatory. Azerbaijan would not have made such an undertaking were it not capable of assuming it. Armenia is not asking you to do the impossible. It is asking you something which makes good sense, common sense. It's the only way to preserve those rights of the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh severely under threat in violation of the Convention. In the absence of such a measure, those inhabitants will be constantly at the mercy of the Baku government. Just lifting the current blockade will not be enough. It must also be ensured that in future, Azerbaijan will not be able to close the road or render it impracticable on one pretext or another. Distinguished members of the Court, you will have noted that the measure requested concerns the uninterrupted free movement of all persons and vehicles, as well as the free movement of cargo. There are no grounds to restrict the second measure to persons, vehicles and cargo of a humanitarian nature, because the enjoyment of rights under the Convention is not subject nor limited by humanitarian requirements. Moreover, the ordinary needs of a civil population clearly far exceed simple humanitarian necessities. Finally, to target humanitarian convoys alone would encourage Azerbaijan to quibble and to use the humanitarian limitation on its obligation to argue time after time that no such need actually exists or that the convoy fails in some way or another to comply with this condition. Madam President, the third and last measure requested by Armenia concerns the supply, uninterrupted supply of energy, indispensable, indispensable excuse me, to a dignified life. Armenia had been obliged to add this request on Thursday because the gas supply was once again abruptly cut off, once again after our request dated 28 December, whereas it had been re-established just before. My colleagues Martin and Salonidis gave you a detailed factual chronology of this and the alleged excuses of Azerbaijan. It's got to stop. Of course, of course, Azerbaijan, as is its want, responded immediately to the third provisional measure requested by Armenia, even though this measure was submitted more than four days before these hearings, and there's nothing untoward about this. Indeed, could provisional measures, supplementary provisional measures, have been requested in other cases right up to the day before hearings and debated during those hearings. Whatever the case may be, we know what Azerbaijan will respond. It's already written down. With contradictions and a bit of confusion, but what Azerbaijan might add will remain unverifiable because Azerbaijan refuses to give access to any third party to the areas concerned. But distinguished members of the court, could I just dwell for an instant on the letter of Azerbaijan of 27 January where they react to our additional request for provisional measure? Indeed, this letter reveals the discriminatory plan of the Baku government. Any government, any government concerned about the fate of those living on what it considers to be its own territory would not have failed to understand that its responsibility is to ensure a regular supply to the inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh with the same speed and consideration as elsewhere. But there is no single sentence to this end in the letter nor any solemn undertaking 
to do their best to prevent these so-called accidental shutdowns from reoccurring. In its letter, Azerbaijan does not seek to resolve a real problem, even though it does not dispute the reality of the gas being shut off. By admitting, supposing one were to admit that these cut-offs were accidental and not intentional, Azerbaijan does not intend to lift its little finger to ensure a normal and regular gas supply to the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. By its letter, Azerbaijan quite simply is seeking to delay your deliberations so that the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh suffer a little bit longer. But Armenia hopes, nonetheless, that your decision will be taken without delay. Distinguished members of the court, the measures requested concern Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan alone because it's its, its behaviour that alone is an issue here. It's Azerbaijan that is organising, sponsoring, supporting the so-called eco-protesters. It's Azerbaijan which is violating in discriminatory fashion the obligation it assumed on the trilateral agreement, thus causing irreparable harm to the rights recognised under the convention. It's Azerbaijan which is responsible for gas and electricity supplies uh, from the areas under its control and thus for the ensuing breakdowns in service. Madam President, for the second time in one short year, irrefutable available evidence is once more converging and this shows that Azerbaijan is not only tolerating but it's also encouraging and pursuing discriminatory policy against the Armenian inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh, depriving them of everything necessary for their survival with the aim of inciting them to leave their ancestral lands to escape the misery thus inflicted. In the letter addressed to you on the 12th of January, Azerbaijan characterised the victims of the blockade as, I quote, its Armenian citizens. However, Azerbaijan refuses, obstinately refuses, these very Armenian citizens the rights it grants to all its other citizens, namely the right to come and go freely, the right to food, heating, health care. Whereas Azerbaijan purportedly seeks to normalise its relations with Armenia, is it too much to ask Azerbaijan to ensure that the inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh a secure existence, decent living conditions? What state, what state treats its own citizens in this fashion? What state besieges 120,000 people of another ethnic and national origin on the pretext that its mining resources have been purloined and that this is unbearable. Distinguished members of the court, what these so-called environmental protests supported and sponsored and organised by Azerbaijan flagrantly show is that, that Azerbaijan's subsoil is more valuable to it than the men, women, children and old people, Armenians, who live upon it. In this context, as fragile as it is noxious, the fierce resistance opposed by Azerbaijan to the elementary requests of Armenia make you fear the worst. And this fierce resistance should in reality be enough to convince you to act Indeed, the provisional measures requested by Armenia, all Armenia asks you for is nothing more than to ensure that the situation which existed until the eve of 12 December be re-established. And that's not only necessary for the survival of 120,000 ethnic Armenians encircled and slowly being strangled in their mountains, but it's important for the usefulness of your judgment on the merits. It has to be done right now. Armenia counts confidently and hopefully on the wisdom of your court. We are persuaded that you will be able to pierce the smoke screen that our opponents will surely create this afternoon and tomorrow morning. I'd like to thank the court for its kind attention and could I request to Madam President to please call Dr. Yegishe Kurakosyan to the
Bar as agent for Armenia to present the final submissions of our country. I thank Professor Dajon for his statement, and I now invite the agent of Armenia.